talked previously about the concept that you don't achieve your goals, but rather you achieve your habits. And that is so true, where a lot of agents, unfortunately, are looking for the next tip, trick, tutorial, or strategy. But the reality is, is that most will never actually execute on it because they don't have the right habits in place, which is a consistent theme across all multiple six and seven figure peer real estate agents. And that's what I want to happen to you. So what I want is for you to build the business of your dreams. But in order to do that, you need the right habits of a seven figure agent to ensure that you're actually going to get there and that you're not searching for something that will keep you exactly where you are right now. So what I've done is I've put together a mashup of my best tips and strategies of how to actually develop the right habits, which habits you need and what you can do in order to skyrocket your production with a bunch of ninja tricks that I guarantee no other agent is going to be talking to you about. So let's dive into how to develop the habits of a winning seven figure peer real estate agent so that as long as you do the right things, you will get there one day too. I want to talk about the four skill sets that million dollar agents have that the ones that have not yet broken that threshold either the struggle with or don't have. Now, a caveat before we get started, when I'm talking about having it, it is having it at the highest degree. And what I mean by that is all of the four things I'm gonna talk about are, are not binary. It's not, do you have it or do you not have it? These are always on a continuum scale. It is how much of it do you have or how little of it do you have? Because everybody has some form of these, but the ones that are breaking seven figures are the ones that are excelling at them at the highest level. So let's dive in and start to break out some of the skill sets that you need in order to break that seven figure peer threshold. Number one is managing your emotions. And this is really important. Um, and we talk a lot about bounce back time within our organization with the Wolfpack, which is how long does it take you to bounce back when something negative happens? And because it's inevitable, you're going to be dealing with nonsense and things that, you know, really grind your gears or piss you off or make you sad, make you angry constantly. There's no way to avoid it. But the ones that win, the ones that break seven, eight figures are the ones that have a short or the shortest bounce back time, which is how long does it take them to have something happen that's negative and then turn around and get back on track to their goals? Because when you look at it, for example, a lot of realtors can like lose a listing or their friend decides to go with a different agent that's not you. And that like emotionally destroys them for days. And sometimes a week, like sometimes they never get over it and it continues to play on their mind. Whereas if you look at the agents that are crushing it and breaking that seven figure threshold, they're the ones that will take five minutes to just, you know, be upset about it, get the emotions out, you know, do something that allows them to help increase their bounce back time, which is usually like going to the gym or listening to a certain song. And then they're back on track because the goals mean so much to them that they're not gonna let anything deter them from hitting those goals, which goes back to my goal setting video talking about why most agents don't have powerful enough goals that mean enough to them. So when you start looking at real estate, it is a roller coaster constantly. Your emotions are tied to your transactions, whether you want to admit it or not. If you do five deals one month for the average agent, you're over the moon. You do zero deals for three months, you're in the gutter. And unfortunately, that means that your emotions are constantly going like this. And when you're in a peak, oftentimes you're excited and you let off the gas. When you're in a dip, oftentimes you're so depressed, overwhelmed and anxious that you can't operate at a high level and you're not making the progress that you need to to get back to that peak. So emotional management is incredibly important and especially looking at that bounce back time of when something negative happens, how long does it take for you to get back on track? Number two is your ability to embrace rejection, which is inevitable in any sales business. Now, because of the different modern brokerages that are coming up, I'm going to explain this from two different perspectives, which is number one, the more traditional rejection, which is going to be rejection from the general public, potential buyers and sellers that you're trying to prospect or convert online leads, things like that. The alternative is the more modern rejections we're starting to face, which is rejections from agents because you're trying to leverage agent attraction and get people to partner with you. Um, let's talk about that because number one, rejection is inevitable. Number two, the big thing a lot of people struggle with is that they take rejection personally. And you have to understand that unless you actually did something wrong and you just you know, flew off the deep end and you're showing up knocking on somebody's door yelling and swearing at them, in almost every single case, rejection has nothing to do with you. And unfortunately, a lot of people take it personal, but they don't understand that if you knocked on that door, called that agent, cold called that potential buyer seller, you have no idea what's going on in their life. 
Maybe their family member just got sick or got cancer or something like that. Maybe somebody important to them just passed away. Maybe they just got fired from their job. Maybe they just, you know, had something extraordinarily negative happen to their life that just rubbed them the wrong way, right? You have no idea what's going on. And if you take rejection personally because it's you think it's something that you did, you're always going to struggle. Now, this is one of the big things because when you look at how to scale, whether it be production, agent attraction, buyers and sellers, anything, the ones that get rejected the most are the ones that have the most business because they're putting in the reps. And if you're constantly scared of getting rejected, you're never going to put in the time and get the reps in that you need to in order to scale your business to the point that you're looking for. Now, one of the key things that you need to do when looking at how to eliminate or reduce your fear of rejection is to simply educate yourself. And what I mean by that is that fear comes from lack of knowledge, right? You've got faith, fear, two polar opposites with risk in the middle. And what happens a lot of the times, so let's say for example, you're cold calling or door knocking, whatever you're prospecting, you've got a script, okay? Fear, faith, risk down the middle. When you start looking at this, the ones that are fearful to cold call to get rejected are the ones where the risk is too high because of their fear and the faith is too low. Well, the faith is too low because you don't have confidence in what you're doing. If you knew, if you had the knowledge that your script was perfect every single time and you knew that it was going to convert, how confident would you be in order to go prospect? Pretty confident because you have the skill sets which reduces the fear because the risk is lower. However, if you have not spent the time in order to develop your objection handlers and present your script of confidence, the fear is gonna be high because the risk is high because the faith is low because of your lack of knowledge. So if you want to reduce the fear of anything, especially rejection, just start to educate yourself and spend more time developing your skill sets, which is going to reduce the risk, which increases the faith and ultimately decreases the fear. Number three is the ability to capture and multiply attention. So this is ultimately what brand awareness is about, right? If you look at any top producing agent in any market, they're the ones with the strongest personal brand, not the strongest brokerage brand. Your brokerage brand means absolutely nothing. So if you're at a brokerage because you think the brand matters, you probably want to rethink why you're at that brokerage uh, because you're probably losing a ton of money. Um, um, but anyways, ultimately, the ability to capture attention is becoming top of mind. And then the ability to amplify or multiply the attention is remaining top of mind and growing your brand awareness in your local market. So this is agents that understand how to position themselves with a unique personal brand, how to differentiate themselves from other agents in the market, and then how to use things like social media, marketing and advertising, even physical, in order to amplify that attention so that they can not just become but remain top of mind and scale because the agent that knows the most people and who the most people know is usually always going to be the agent that does the most deals. So that's why it's really important to understand that you need to treat real estate as a business, not just as a hobby, not just as a solopreneur type thing, but there's different divisions. Right? You need to understand marketing. You need to understand advertising. You need to understand the different elements that go into capturing and multiplying attention. Otherwise, you're always going to stay in the small, not in the big, and you're usually going to have to continue to work for years and years and years to help build your name up because you haven't found ways to create leverage that's going to allow you to multiply that at scale. Now, the fourth one is creating leverage of your time and your income. Now, previously, most people attempted to do this in a way that many are realizing is not the most efficient way, which is one of maybe three ways uh, if we look at it this way. Number one, starting a brokerage. Number two, starting a traditional team. Number three, investing into real estate with your active income. I'll break down why that is, you know, based on the continuum, not the best way to really do it. Because when you explore it, creating a brokerage, well, a lot of people think that's gonna create leverage of your time and your income, but ultimately your expenses skyrocket. You've got no exit strategy, you have no flexibility with your lifestyle. And because expenses increase, your income might increase, but your profit usually decreases or is not of the same multiple that you'd be looking for. And again, it becomes adult daycare, you deal with attrition, you deal with all kinds of risk, liability, and basically it is like anti-leverage compared to what most people think. Very similar with starting a traditional real estate team at a traditional brick and mortar franchise brokerage is you think that you're going to create leverage of your time, leverage of your income by getting agents to partner with you. But what you realize almost every single time is that most agents that wanna be on a team don't work like you, which you're gonna struggle with mentally and wondering why they're not doing what they need to. Uh, number two, the ones that do work like you do are gonna become strong agents and they're gonna leave your team because they don't wanna build your brand and make you money, they wanna go do it themselves. Um, and there's no exit strategy as well. 
and you don't create a flexible lifestyle because ultimately you have no flexibility of time. You have to be there to support everybody. So that's ultimately why I joined a brokerage like eXp uh, Realty is because it allows you to create leverage of your income and your time. It allows you to create leverage of your time because of the cloud-based system, the multiple brokers, um, and developing other leaders within your organization that you bring into the company that can do the same thing that you can so that when you go on vacation, you don't have to worry about your business collapsing or agents getting upset and it creates leverage of your income because based on building a strong brand, when you capture and multiply attention, if you're not at a brokerage that allows you to partner with agents at scale globally, then you're always gonna have to be doing it in a linear way, not an exponential way, like we have here with the ability to create the additional income streams, create the residual income, which again, going to that third component of investing into real estate, still an incredible way to do it. The only difference is that if you're only investing using active income, if you want to scale your portfolio, you have to invest more time or the same time it got you to get your current portfolio again. Whereas when you look at models like this, if you want to double your residual income, like doubling your rental portfolio, then basically you just have to keep doing what you're doing and wait a year. And most cases it'll within reason double. And then what you can do is take the residual and use it to invest in properties. But it's really important to understand that as realtors start to make more money, their recurring expenses increase, but they don't have any recurring income. And this is what keeps agents, even that get to the seven figure level, not wealthy, but rich, because they have money, but they don't have time. And ultimately, the way you wanna build your business when you get to the seven figure level is to actually have the time to enjoy it. People sit on their hands in, in real estate industry. I mean, Gene, you work with a lot of real estate agents. Now, none of your clients, of course. Um, but I mean, you see, Gene, you you develop you uh, deliver leads to clients all the time, and they don't they don't hustle for it. What do you think is that difference between someone like Mike, who hustle and grinds, and just has the mental mind space of like I'm a, I'm a killer, I'm a king, I'm gonna take I'm gonna dominate my market space to the average Joe real estate agent. Actually, we'll call him Bob because we haven't ripped on Bob in a while from Remax. Bob from Remax. That fucker, dude. That fucking guy. Um, but I mean, Gene, where's that difference that you see? Cause you work with so many different types of agents. Hunger, H hunger, hundred percent. Like he, Mike wants to be the lion, right? Right. He, he wants to be the king of the jungle. And I think, so he, listen, even some of my clients do it and I, I do it. Sometimes you're too busy, quote unquote, too busy. Sometimes you're too busy. You're too comfortable air quote, too comfortable. Right. right. I, I, sometimes it's the wrong timing. Sometimes you screw it up. I mean, there's a million ways to Sunday, but I think what Mike said was really important is, and you actually, you sort of backed it up, but that air of confidence is a killer. That's your, oh. that's your best. Like we talked about this years ago, right? On this, sh on this show where my business blossomed when I went from, please buy my service. I think we're really good to look, man, we, this is, I'm here to help you, you know, and we're as good as it gets. And if you're willing to pay for as good as it gets, we can do do what you need us to do and if mm -hmm. not that's fine right because i right. know that there's other people waiting so the level of confidence when that when that shifts in your favor and you're holding your chest higher and you know that you can beat other people with your creative marketing so mike's already told us a couple ways that he does these things and he already knows he's got a leg up on some of the older agents because they're not outdoor knocking they're most likely not using instagram nah. right and by, by the way I think you should tell everybody real quick, and you don't have to, obviously, but I can't imagine why you wouldn't. What's your Instagram username so they can yeah. go follow you? Yeah, <laughs> thanks so much. Uh, yeah. It's Mike.Sherrard. Yeah, and, so and I would love to go see what you did for that $15 million listing as far as the marketing goes. I would love to see. And, and, and Greg, here's one more thing, too, because okay. we talk about this over the last couple of weeks. Ever, ever since 2019 came, I've been pitching vulnerability. And Mike, yes. you said it in a roundabout way, but people love the fact that you're vulnerable. I keep hearing that when, when people watch my videos, they go, I just love that you're vulnerable. Whether it's me, I had this one video one time <laughs> that I did where it hit me at two o'clock in the morning, dude. And I was doing, I, I don't know if you saw it, Craig, and I, I kind of started to cry a little bit. It had to do with, with um, somebody who passed away. Oh yes, I did see that. And, and I, it was funny because I didn't say anything. I just came to my office, I just went live and I, and I said what, what I needed to say. And you could tell that I was emotionally tore up. Mm -hmm. and But I didn't say anything. And I let it go. I went to bed. And the next morning, my wife calls me. And she's like, why am I getting text messages if you're OK? And I'm like, <laughs> what do you mean? She goes, I don't know. What are you, crying on social media or something? <laughs> but, but I got a lot of really good feedback on the fact that people appreciated 
that I said what I had to say. I didn't give a shit what it looked like. It was important for me to get the message out. People came back and said, you know, I, I was I, I was helped by that. It made me feel like it, it, it was important. It was special. And I think 2019, you know, 2018 and previous was all about looking good, man. I'm driving yeah. a Maserati because I'm crushing the money game. Well, now everybody can do that, right? Like you can just go out and rent one for the day and make it look like you're a super mega agent. People know that that's available, so they look less. It looks less important. What's important now is, Mike. What do you do in your spare time, buddy? You, what are you doing? Are you out hustling? Are you a nice guy? You giving to charity? What do you, you? You have a family? How about the kids? Why? You know, like now that I have access to you 24/7, I'm looking more for the real shit than I am for that other stuff that looks fancy. And I think that vulnerability for me—that's what I'm preaching for 2019. And I don't, I don't think you got to go out and cry about it. But when you go out and you show the real losses, <laughs> people are like, "Look, you lose, dude. The best agents in the business lose listings." Yeah. I don't care who you are, and that's because sometimes it's because the client, the potential client, has a brother-in-law that they like better than you for some reason, and they just feel like they got to give it to their family. But you're gonna lose listings. So for you to tell me you hit 100, percent I'm calling bullshit. You're lying to me. I don't trust you now. So show me the real stuff. I just lost that. Help me understand what I need to do to get better. Like that vulnerability from that perspective is gonna attract followers more and more. I love that. Mike, what are, are you putting some vulnerability into your business uh, right now as well? Big time, man, 100%. You know, I love that what Jim was talking about is, you know, the 2019 trends. I don't know if, if you guys have ever heard of the MF CEO project by Andy Frizzella, but he recently did a video on the future of social media influencers. And I love what he said. He said the mathematical formula for engagement on social media 2019 going forward is E2I equals FC. Entertainment, education, and impact equals focused engagement. Uh, wait, 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 hold on. Wait, you got to yeah. do that. You got to do that again. Back the Seriously. fuck up. You got to e do it again. E2I what? E2I equals FC. So entertainment, education, and impact equals focused engagement. Because what happened, and I actually talked to a guy who works at Instagram, and they were saying that early on, they were rewarding the booty pics and the things like that because they wanted to reward people that were grabbing attention. Right. But now what's happening is the value from that's diminishing. And instead of getting a thousand you know, heart emojis and, and googly eyes on a photo, what really <laughs> matters is someone commenting, being like, wow, you look amazing. How can I get the same results? Or wow, I love, you know, do you have a diet plan that can help me look like that? It's the focus engagement that's gonna start winning and not just the overall quantity. And that's the same that goes with real estate. You have a really neat opportunity to educate and entertain if you're going through a property inspection and you see something really weird that people might not ever think about and you can educate them, but in an entertaining way. And by doing so, you can impact them because that's something that they'll carry with themselves. So there's so many opportunities that we have as real estate agents that people, the general public, has never seen before, whether it be a luxury property or a foreclosure, something disgusting, something quirky, something neat, that we can use to entertain, educate, and further impact people. And that's what's gonna quantify the focus engagement. And over time, what you're seeing is, you know, even the influencers that are getting paid, the ones that are getting paid millions now aren't the ones with a million followers. They're the hyper-engaged niche ones with 50,000 that are very niched into a topic. And the real estate agents that are winning are the ones like, you know, you, Greg, Brian, uh, Kevin, you know, some people like that, that are really honing in their craft and sharing value with people. And that's what's qualifying them to get this, you know, mass amount of focused engagement. In the US economy, consumer spending is the number one economic driver of this economy, but real estate is number two. Um, which which is a pretty incredible thing, but it tends uh, it makes sense. It's tends to be people's most valuable asset, right? It has a huge impact on uh, personal lifestyle, livelihood, everything. If uh, if people make wise decisions or or are effective in their buying and selling and stuff, that's that can have a big impact on their life. Um, in your role, and you'll see in in a few more questions where I'm going with this, but I'm curious. Do you get a sense for that type of responsibility as you work with, with consumers and you're helping them transact in real estate, buying and selling? Um, do you get a sense that you're involved in a, in a really major part of their 
their life and, and a major economic driver in the U.S. and Canada? Big time. You know, one thing that I always made a promise to myself is that I will treat my client's money like it's my money. And I find this is something that a lot of realtors fail with is, you know, for us in Calgary, if I'm going to list a property for $580,000, if we get an offer for five sixty, dollars everybody's going to split the difference and go five seventy. dollars Well, if I save them $1,500 and go to five seventy one five, dollars just by negotiating harder, I just paid for their legal fees. And I always promise myself that I will never split the difference. And by doing that, I've built so much trust with clients. A lot of people think when you're working with a buyer's agent that it doesn't make the slightest difference. But by tracking, again, going back to numbers, by tracking the money that I save sellers and that I save buyers whenever they're buying or selling, um, I have stats that I can show of why it would be advantageous to work with me solely based on negotiation, right? So I think it's important to treat it like it's your, you're invested in that transaction because people worked extremely hard to get to that point. Um, and it's a big turning point in their life. Similarly, I think it's important to make the overall experience memorable, right? One of the things that tainted my buying experience was when I showed up on possession day, one of the two agents was there, gave me the keys, door, like house is cold, lights were off and never saw them again. So I started doing very lavish over the top things for every single client on possession day, regardless of what price point the home was, right? Whether it be a hundred thousand or uh, 1.1 million, they were going to get a, an experience that they would never, ever forget with me. Mindset for you. I've watched your journey. I've been a part of it and just so honored to see it. Um, you've leaned into support, right? You've gone deeper and you've hired coaches and people don't know this about the, the extremely, um, like the top of the field about how much energy and money and time they dedicate to growing oneself. Can you share that a little bit, you know, about kind of like what you've been doing and, and how that's impacted your business? Because again, they may not see that behind the Lamborghinis you've got and the, you know, the Rolexes and all this, this, again, you're, you're a flashy dude, right? You know that you love or hate it, haters against it, but yeah. behind that, there's just this mountain of work that you've done on yourself. Can you comment on that? Yeah, like you kind of touched on it at the very beginning as well, which is, you know, even though, it, especially in my RevShare organization, I, I, of course, make more than anybody else by a significant margin. I am still working from 4 a.m. till 10 p.m., seven days a week, ever, and I don't have to. I could, I could step away. I've got a million dollar residual, and I outwork every single person. And one of the principles is I like to lead, um, you know, lead with intent, but I also like to lead by example. And I want people to know, like, hey, you know, I, if I can do this still, and I don't have to, you can do this. And when it goes to coaching, this has changed my business forever. And I think when, when you start looking at, you know, a quote that's very near and dear to my heart is that your income is a direct reflection of the person or entrepreneur that you've become. So for example, I, I actually recorded the video about this last week. I haven't put it out yet, but it's looking at my business in stages. So, you know, from zero to making your six figures, you can essentially bulldoze your way to six figures just by doing the things you know you need to do right and that just comes from discipline and consistency well if you're not making six figures yet the only reason why is because you have not become disciplined or consistent that is a limitation on you well when you look at six figures to multiple six figures what does that look like that looks like repeat referral which comes down to leverage. So now you start needing to create leverage within your business to start to build scalability. Well, I needed to learn CRM, nurturing, database, repeat, referral opportunities. I, you know, had to get to the next phase. Well, what allowed me to go from six figures to multiple seven figures? That was hiring staff, new offers, and being able to have a bigger global opportunity instead of a local opportunity. I had not become the type of person yet that was able to lead people, train people, because I was a solopreneur. Well, now when we look at my journey of going from multiple seven to eight figures a year, the reason why I'm hiring all these people, which we'll get to, is I've never been there, so I don't know what it's like, but 
I have not yet become an eight figure entrepreneur. So I cannot have the audacity to say that I should be making it because here's the one thing that most people don't understand. You do not get paid for your time. You get paid for the value you bring to the market center. You could work 12 hours a day, seven days a week for the next 10 years and still be broke for the rest of your life. If you are not bringing value to the market center, right? I know some people four hour work week, they literally work four hours a day, four hours a week, but they're making multiple eight figures because of the value they brought to the marketplace. I have not created the leverage within my systems and processes to scale to that level. So I hire coaches and mentors to be able to put those pieces together at the different phases of where I know I have limitations, right? It's you brought up Alex Ramosi. He says, um, you're not making as much money as you think you should because you're not as good as you think you are. And right. it's very much the truth. A lot of people don't have the humility to say, well, well shoot, I'm not that good yet. I, I've got room to improve. And for me to go from, you know, within reason zero to low six figures, I had Arte Syndicate. So Andy Frazella and my lads, I was learning the mindset because the number one reason why realtors fail is not because they don't have the skill set, the ability, the training to every realtor under the sun knows what they need to do to break six figures. I've never met one that doesn't. Yeah. Client acquisition, you prospect, you network, you have content, you lend, you lead gen, that's it, right? It's very simple. But yeah, you don't need systems, you don't need process, you don't need brand, you just need effort, right? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's very, very simple. They overcomplicate it. They're looking for the shiny penny. Um, but I needed the mindset because as a corporate real, you know, employee, I didn't have it. So, Arate. Okay, well, when I started going to that next phase, I had to build my personal brand. Gerard Adams came into the picture. Okay, well, now that I built my personal brand, amplified it globally, I needed to leverage more YouTube and things like that. I brought in Vanessa Lau. Okay, well, now that I'm at this phase where I want to go to eight figures, that is all based on customer journey. So I brought in George Bryan, who's the number one customer journey specialist in the world. But a lot of people don't understand the reinvestment. Like when I had $15,000 for my name, I spent 5,000 of it on Arte. When, you know, exactly, right? And, and now like I'm paying George $200,000 this year to help me with customer journey. But I go in with the mindset of investment versus expense. All too many people see money going out as an expense, but if every time I do something, I go with the mindset, hey, I'll gladly pay George 200K because I know that's gonna make me 20 million in the next five years, easily. So it's that framing of perspective that I think people need to change. And this goes back to coaching, you know, Darren, I think this is probably the principle that has changed my business the most paired with unattachment, which is the concept of one more. And ironically, you know, Ed's put out his book and he talks about this, which yeah. is funny because this is a principle that has been near and dear to me far before he sort of, you know, preaching it to the world. But there's two different applications that this applies, ironically, in two different ways than he talks about in his book. So the first aspect of it is focusing on one thing, one thing until completion, right? So he talks about one more, mine is one thing. But for example, I got my daily power list and I focus on one task until I complete that task. So many people have five things on their power list and they'll say, I'm going to do 25% of this. Oh, I don't want to do it anymore. I go to the next one and then the next one and the next one. And people wonder why they feel overwhelmed. It's because you're chasing so many things. I don't stop a task until that one thing is done. But also YouTube, I didn't add in TikTok or Reels until that one thing, which was YouTube, was dialed in. And then I add. So that's one important part of it. But the second thing is the concept that applies to coaching. So many people hire coaches, read books, watch YouTube videos, go to seminars, pay for webinars. And what they do is they look for that that learning experience to change the course of their business forever by essentially doing the work for them. The mentality I've had toward coaching or any sort of learning environment that I put myself in is how can I just learn one thing from this that if I apply it, it will change my business forever. I have literally paid George $200,000 this year. There's actually one thing related to customer journey that I learned that I've already made over $200,000 by applying and the year's a, a third of the way done. One thing was what I was looking for. 
one yeah. thing every single time when you go to a you know real x event when you go to a real event don't look for that event to come back and build out your business plan for you look for one thing that one person said that connected with you that said hey if i latch onto this consistently relentlessly that one thing will change my business. And with coaching, that's always the mentality that I've taken is how can I just extract one thing? But the final thing I'll say about coaching is external. A lot of people are looking at coaches, rightfully so, that are internal to the real estate industry. I think what's given me a leg up in my content and my business is that I pull in coaches that are external to the industry because when I'm learning from people that are not in the realm of this ecosystem, when I apply it to real estate, now it becomes innovative. Now it becomes different. Now it's thinking from a different lens that the average agent has, everybody knows what Tom Ferry is going to say or, or any of these other coaches. So you're one of the same, just presenting it differently. But when you pull something external, now you've got this secret sauce that nobody else is looking into. I mean, it's uh, you impacted a lot there that we could just go super deep on. Um, you're you're so right, and I, I jokingly say things when I'm running a webinar, a workshop, a, a sales strategy session, and I'll just say, guys, with this one thing, I should just stop today, let mm -hmm. you go home, and let you work on it, and then I joke it off because. Most people aren't hearing that the way they should. But in reality, it's like, I should just fucking shut my mouth, let them go and let them chug on this for a while and just know, like block that off and finish the bridge, right? Like I always say, there's these unfinished bridges everywhere, these overhangs and they're everywhere in your business. It's almost like if you looked on your Google tabs and you see how many are open, you're like, oh my goodness. And uh, if you just finished it, I know personally in my own, I used to do that. My calendar, I've been calendared hard for years, like ever since 2014. And then I would move a little thing forward an inch and then another thing an inch and then another thing an inch. And then a year goes by and you're like, why did I not complete as much as I should have? Yeah. And even with discipline, you just can't get done enough that way. Um, yeah. I love that. Well, I think it's, it's uh, again, going down to learning how to say no, right? Like I now have six, seven figure on, uh, opportunities coming to me on a monthly basis. I, like I know what's on my plan for the rest of 2023, the new offers I'm creating, the new plans and content and this and that. I am not doing any initiative with anybody else for the rest of 2023 because I know what my plan is and I'm gonna work toward that. And if you wanna do something and we wanna collaborate on something cool, well, wonderful. I've got a pipeline for 2024, but this year is dialed in. I'm working to the plan. That's it. That's all. And I think again, like, you know, I'll go on record and say that your program, the re-education program is the most valuable real estate program I've literally ever seen in my life. And when you break down the concept of focusing on one thing at a time, whether it be the seed initiative or anything else like that, about being able to basically farm and dominate an area, if you focus on one area and dominate that area, you will be a top producer but they're trying to be everything to every market, right? So I think when people start to focus on this one thing initiative, it, it literally gives you that clarity, that focus, the alleviation of chasing the shiny penny in the next trend and say, if I dial in the basics with this one thing, that is going to yield exceptional results because what you'll see in real estate is I know, and so do you, you know, agents that have seven figure businesses from cold calling, from door knocking, from video, from mailers, from events, it does not matter. But each one of them has become the master of the market with that one thing or that one niche. And a lot of people are saying, I'm gonna chase it all instead of just being the best at one. If you're struggling in business and life, one of the main contributing factors is that you're not keeping promises to yourself. This ultimately leads to you feeling overwhelmed, like you've hit a plateau, like you can't do it, or that you're not cut out to achieve something in your life. So what I'm going to do today is break down the five Ds that kill your business and keep you from fulfilling the promises you make to yourself. All too many people build this self-doubt because of the fact that every time they say they're going to do something, it somehow, for some reason, doesn't come to life and I'm going to break down how you can get over that so that you can start to build massive momentum 
in your business and life and start to achieve anything that you want. I'm going to break down an exact example so that you can relate this to your business because once you understand these five Ds and how to apply it, it will completely change the trajectory of every single aspect of your business and life. Okay, so because I primarily talk about business on my channel, I'm going to use a business example, but this applies to anything in your life, business, relationships, health, anything. So let's just use this as a reference point and then you can apply this to any aspect of your business or life. So the example I'll use is let's say you're a brand new real estate agent and you want to do 24 deals this year. Let's go through the five D's of what usually leads to agents not doing 24 deals in their first year and falling very much short of that, which is what yields the average statistic in real estate of 87% of agents failing because of these five D's. So without further ado, let's dive into them. Number one is doubt. Doubt in yourself of if you can actually do this. So many agents say that they want to do 24 deals in their first year, similar to any business or any aspect of life where people are telling you what you should do, or you've got a certain goal that is of the industry standard. But a lot of times there's some level of doubt that you have where you're saying you want to do it, but you have not fully yet convinced yourself that you believe you're capable of doing it. You're saying it because it's the industry norm or it's what everybody else has done, but you're doubting yourself. And what happens is that doubt starts to weigh extremely heavy on you because you have not yet fully convinced yourself that you're capable of doing it, or you don't have this unwavering confidence that you will do it. It's doubt that stems from maybe past failure years. Maybe it stems from, you know, other aspects of your life that did not go so well, or you didn't achieve certain goals, or you weren't a high performer, and you're telling yourself you want to do something, but then you've got this doubt. And as you start to go through the motions of doing what you know you need to do to hit that goal, that doubt consciously weighs on the back of your mind. And it gets to the point where you say you're going to do something like you say you're going to prospect, you say you're going to do videos, but because you're doubting that it's even possible for you to do, you start to not do the prospecting. You start to not do the videos because you say, you know what, maybe I'm, maybe I can't even do it. Maybe I'm not cut out for it. And that doubt is what really starts to weigh heavy and keep you from fulfilling those promises to yourself. Number two is a big one, which is distortion. And this is making a problem much bigger or much smaller than it actually is. So let me give some context to that so that you better understand. So let's say that you want to do 24 deals in your first year of real estate, and you know that you need to prospect for three hours a day, maybe three to five times a week. You know that you need to do two videos a week on YouTube and have an active presence on a daily basis on other social media platforms and simply just connect with people. Well, one of two things happens. So the first one is one that most people fall victim to, which is the distortion in the direction of making it a bigger problem than it actually is. So they think, oh my God, you know, three hours of prospecting, how, you know, I can't even pick up the phone. It weighs a million pounds. I have to go door knock. What if they shut the door on me? What if, you know, what if it doesn't work? What if they swear or two videos a week? I can't even get in front of the camera. You know, how can I do that? I'm, I'm, I'm an introvert. I'm not comfortable speaking into this device very here or social media. I've, I've never even opened it before. And they make it this big grandiose problem or something goes wrong along your journey where maybe you get your first deal and the property doesn't sell oh my gosh, my first deal, like I, I can't get it done. Is every deal gonna be like this? Is every client gonna terminate their listing with me? And you start to make things a much bigger problem than it actually is, which starts to get that feeling of overwhelm and then you fall victim to not fulfilling the promises to yourself. Now, on the opposite side of the spectrum, some people make it much easier than it actually is. So they'll say two videos a week, no problem. Like that's just, you know, two 15 videos a week. I can do that at any time. Three hours of prospecting, that's three hours out of a 12 hour day. How, how difficult can it be? Knock on some doors, make a couple phone calls. Who cares if I get rejected? It's not a big deal. But what you'll see is that the time management and the mental grit and the fortitude it takes to do that is very much a big deal and you make it easier. So what happens is you start to say, you know what, I didn't get those two videos done this week. I can get it done next week. I'll do four. It's no big deal. And you start to fail to keep the promises to yourself. So distortion is a big one and you really have to audit as you're going through your business and life when certain thing comes up or whenever you're making specific goals, are you making it a much bigger problem than it needs to be? Or 
are you underestimating it and making it a much easier process and not really giving credit to how much work it's actually going to take to achieve a set goal. Number three is going to be discouragement. And this happens inevitably in everybody's part of a journey. So let's talk about again, keeping very similar on track with the theme of maybe prospecting and video content on a journey of an agent looking to do 24 deals in their first year. What happens is people get discouraged because they say, again, no problem, three hours of prospecting, let's hit those phones, let's hit those doors. Three hours later, 300 phone calls later, zero leads. Day one. Day two rolls by, zero leads again. Day three rolls by, maybe you start to build momentum and you get one lead, you call them and they're not ready to buy right now. And you start to get discouraged. And same thing goes with video content. I see this constantly where agents are gonna do, you know, two videos a week and then they put out content for one, two, three months and they don't yet get a client. They say, you know, I've done three months of content, two videos a week and I still don't have a client. It's never gonna work out for me. And they get discouraged. And what happens is this again starts to make you fail to keep those promises to yourself to stay consistent and stay on track because you say, you know what? You know, I've done it for three months. <sighs> Maybe I just can't do it. Maybe it's not for me. Maybe all these other people had something unique about them that I don't have. And you start to get discouraged to continue to do it or cold calling, door knocking, or again, any avenue of prospecting, you know, maybe I just don't have the right script and I'm not going to change it, but maybe it's just not for me. Or maybe I'm, I'm just not cut out to do that and, and it's not going to work out. And you start to get discouraged because what's happening is that the tangible outcome is not aligning with the work ethic you're putting in, but that goes back to the important notion of delayed gratification. Number four is distraction. Things that start to get in the way of the journey of you doing the things you know you need to do. So for example, keeping on theme, this could be like prospecting, but then there's two different types of distractions. There's going to be life distractions and business distractions. Well, on the life distraction side, you've got trips coming up. Your friends ask for you to go on a boat trip. They ask you to go on some, you know, trip to an all-inclusive place and go party for a week. And it's really enticing and you're burnt out, you're exhausted, it's not coming together, you're discouraged and you take the distraction. Or maybe content's not working out on this certain platform, you know, three months of content on YouTube, you haven't yet got a client, distraction, AI pops up, TikTok pops up, this pops up, that pops up. And instead of staying consistent to the mission, to the proven process, they start to look at these distractions and these shiny pennies of, oh my God, this agent crushed it on this platform. Well, maybe YouTube's not for me. I'll go over there or prospecting, you know, really can't make it work at that. Maybe it's not for me. I'm going to do this instead. And they start jumping from one thing to the next, or they start taking the bait of distractions that are deviating their focus from where they know they need to be. And the number five is division which is being torn between certain things that you want. So oftentimes what happens in real estate is you're torn between the lifestyle that you would like to have as well as the business that you want to have. And what most people fail, especially in their first year of any business, is that they underestimate the sacrifice that it's going to take to build the momentum to yield that lifestyle that you want. So what happens is you're torn between, you know, right now it's perfectly sunny at one of the most beautiful days that we've had this year and I'm in here recording content. Do I need to be recording content? No, but I'm not torn because I know what I'm working toward. I'm not excited about going out and having a patio beer. Would it be nice? Yes, but I'm not doing it because I have crystal clear focus of fulfilling the promises I've made to myself to record content today. So I'm not torn, but a lot of people get torn between this lifestyle and this balance that they want to have with the business that they want to have. And, and what most people start realizing is that to build the business that you want to have, you have to make a sacrifice of that lifestyle for the interim until you build momentum, which could take like many three years to do. And that torn, that division starts to really weigh heavy where again, most people would say it's the nicest day of the year so far. Everybody's out. It's a Saturday. It's gorgeous. I can do these videos another day. I'm going to go out, have dinner on a patio, or I'm going to go out for a walk or a bike or a hike or a drive or do something. 
because I'll just do these videos another time. That is failing to keep the promise to yourself. So these are the five D's that you need to start looking at very consciously and audit how you approach every aspect of your business and life. Because once you get to the point where you can resolve these five D's or at least have a better handle on them, your business and your life will completely change and you will start to achieve everything you've ever wanted.